So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'll come back to the pedestrians. I uh, can learn a lot from them actually, from you. Coordination, lane formation, oscillations. So new things will also come in. The complex systems, dissolving traffic jams, rise of anarchy, self-controlled traffic lights, and uh, if there's enough time, also some further words on sustainability and collective intelligence. All right, so it's kind of clear that uh, pedestrians are faced with coordination problems and uh, you've probably seen this famous intersections, probably the most famous one in terms of pedestrian flows uh, is located in Tokyo, Japan. And uh, it's really a, an interesting experience being there as well. So the coordination problem is, of course, uh, when two people meet, should they go to the right or to the left? And how do they coordinate? And there are probabilities of going to the right and to the left. This is how it could be formalized. And it turns out that somehow in the course of time, lanes are being formed. As we can see over here in examples, that you can watch all over the world, actually. And we also figured out that actually there's a preference for one side, either the right-hand side or the left-hand side. But in any case, there is a behavioral convention eventually emerging. Nevertheless, even if we assume a 50-50 behavior, I mean, 50% chance to go to the right, 50% chance to go to the left, we'll still find the formation of lanes of uniform walking direction. Those lanes will also grow in size. That means we start with many of them, like four, and they narrow down to three, or eventually two in most cases. And that is because such a coordination pattern which is self-organized is actually improving the efficiency. So there are less inc incidents where people basically have to stop. And obviously it's very efficient to walk in lanes and all of that happens without people even planning this or thinking about it or solving any mathematical equations. It's just based on the interactions that they face. And that kind of behavior can be actually understood by means of a social force model, for example. This is a physics inspired model. There are also other models for pedestrian behavior, but it's one of the most popular ones in the world. And basically it uses two equations, an equation of motion, which describes that the change in location is given by the speed. And then the question is how to specify the change of speed with time, in other words, acceleration. And it works surprisingly well to specify that as a superposition of different forces, such as a driving force, which describes the adaptation of the actual speed to a desired speed and direction of motion within a certain period of time. And then there are interactions, in many cases, these would be repulsive interactions among pedestrians, but also with regard to walls. And in many cases, one would add also a noise term to take into account the variability in behavior. We could also add attraction terms to account for people walking in groups, like tourists, for example, or people being attracted to window displays they want to go shopping. So all of that can be done easily. And then you can basically simulate that. And that's what we've done in the previous slide. And that produces those efficient lanes of motion by its optimization, as I said before. Now, why is it justified uh, to talk about pedestrians in a course on game theory, not only because there's the coordination game that leads to self-organized conventions, but also because the social force model itself can be formulated in terms of the differential games. Okay. Now, 
Lane formation is not the only pattern that is actually observed in pedestrian crowds. There are other pattern formation phenomena, such as, for example, oscillatory flows and bottlenecks. A bit hard to see with those lighting conditions over here, but there is a bottleneck. And there are people arriving from two sides that all want to use that bottleneck. You can see their oscillatory flows as a result. And there's neither a traffic light nor a policeman nor planning involved. It's just everyone is pushing a little bit. So pressure builds up and that pressure could actually eventually become so big to turn the flow direction. This is really interesting from our point of view, at least. And it has even inspired a new kind of traffic light control as what I will explain you later on, but that's not the only thing it inspired. <laughs> you see, I find that this was really inspiring. Um, it also inspired a new way of producing chips. I mean, a different algorithm, basically, how to make chip production more efficient. And that actually saved a big chip producer millions a year, unfortunately, I did not get anything of that, but anyway, everyone was happy with the result. I will mention that later in a little more detail. Now, what is important really to understand is that complex systems, complex dynamical systems in particular, behave differently from what we're used to from other kinds of systems. And we need to distinguish basically complex from complicated system. So what you see here is a complicated system, a car being made up of thousands of parts, but those parts are at a very predefined location. They perform a predefined deterministic function Everything is well controllable in the car with a few parameters like gas, steering wheel, or brake. So it's a well controllable system. Otherwise, you would probably not buy a car or even use one. However, if many cars interact with each other, then we're facing a complex dynamical system. And things happen that nobody wants to happen, including traffic jams. I can see some patterns over here as they're found actually on freeways. And so what is special about complex systems? Now, these are typical systems with a large number of interacting system elements. And those would be individuals, companies, countries, cars, whatever. Um, among those interacting system elements, it would be nonlinear or network interactions, and that can lead to rich system behavior, as we'll also see in the following slides, but we've seen that already on previous slides, where the same system and the pedestrian crowds can show different kinds of behavior, like lane formation, oscillations, to mention just two of those phenomena. Those complex systems uh, behave often dynamic rather than static, uh, often probabilistic rather than deterministic, and they show, in many cases, surprising, often even paradoxical system behavior, such as a slower is faster effect. We'll see one of those effects in connection with chip production later on. Complex systems would be hardly predictable often seemingly uncontrollable and they challenge our common way of thinking, but they're almost everywhere around us. That means in nature, ecosystems, the way our brain works, the way our, our body works, political systems, um, businesses, science, you know, all of the, those are basically complex dynamical systems, not just crowds and traffic, stock markets, of course, as well. And they are often a nightmare for decision makers because they don't know enough about complex systems. Limits of predictability are well known. Weather car forecast may be pretty good, 
by now, but they're never exact, as you know. The longer you try to predict into the future, the less accurate will those predictions be. And even if you would have a thousand times more data or a million times more data, that wouldn't mean you could make exact predictions of future weather. Why am I confident saying this? Because the equations behind uh, weather are fluid dynamic equations and they show the phenomenon of turbulence and the turbulence is what causes those unpredictable patterns. So we do know mathematical features of turbulence and those imply that uh, sometime in the future, the conditions cannot be predicted well enough given finite accuracy of the initial and boundary conditions. Uh, we can never measure a parameter 100% exact. There's always some finite confidence interval. So we'll never have a perfect weather prediction. But there are other kind of phenomena such as um, traffic jams. And this shows kind of the illusion of control, right? So here is a system where everyone has the state of the art technology Everyone has good education, a driver's license, there's perfect visibility. It's an easy task to drive in a circle at constant speed without avoiding accidents, it seems. But still, traffic jams happen and nobody wanted that to happen. So why then is it happening? It's because of a phenomenon called systemic instability, where small variations actually amplify over time. So one car goes a little bit slower, say, the next one realizes that a little late needs to brake, needs to brake a little bit harder to compensate for the delay, the next car even harder. And in this way, basically, you, you end up with cars being stopped, the traffic jam is there, and then once you have the traffic jam, it actually moves backward, not forward. Why is that? Because cars drive out of the traffic jam, which is standing, and new cars arrive in the back, so the entire thing moves backward, all right? So it can be understood also in terms of mathematical equations, but it's a system that suffers from systemic instability. And we've seen other systems of this kind, such as tragedies of the commons, where in many cases, uh, cooperation of everyone would be favorable for everyone, but unfortunately, in many situations, cooperation is unstable, and that's why it erodes, and eventually you end up with that strategy of the problems, right? Similar phenomenon in a sense. And now we're basically entering times which are characterized by systems that are increasingly networked. Did you want to ask it? And now there are many people um, and each person has different character, say, um, and we would think in order to understand that system, we just need to know everyone well. Yeah. Well, that was perhaps true in the past, but once you introduce interactions among the people, I mean, network them in the sense where they start networking among each other, then those interactions will cause phenomena that are of the hardly predictable kinds that uh, we've just discussed before. And the more you network, the more do the network structures take over and determine what actually happens in the system. That means perhaps the properties of the individual will not anymore matter that much, but we can understand the system behavior from the interactions. And that requires a completely different perspective on those systems. I mean, we see subjects and objects, right? Because they're material. But what really matters is what we don't see in many cases, which are those interactions. 
So it's a kind of a shift like uh, from the solar centric worldview um, to a heliocentric worldview. We have the course of the increasing networking to look at systems in new ways. And that's why we often get things wrong about complex systems. In fact, in those complex network systems, the intended effects will often not happen. Instead, you often have side effects. You may have feedback effects. You may have cascading effects. And this is what determines what really happens in those network systems. And it's important to know that. That's why it sounds like a nightmare to be confronted with complex dynamical systems. They tend to self-organize for a non-scientist may be difficult to make sense of that self-organization. Even for scientists, it may be challenging. But interestingly enough, that self-organization and the patterns that it produces are often resilient to recently small perturbations. So, you know, you can basically change things a little and still the system will perform a certain function. And that can be used actually to your favor. Establishing suitable interactions will produce a desirable outcome by itself. You can have the system work for you, basically. If you put the right interactions in place, you don't have to force the system then to do a certain thing, these will just happen by self organization. And this is how complex dynamical systems would be managed, all right? Just to give you an illustration, we're very much annoyed, of course, by traffic jams. And so just to show you that we understand the phenomenon, we simulate the mathematical equations that produce stop and go traffic that we've seen before in the other video. And uh, we want to understand why this happens and then we want to dissolve those traffic jacks. In order to understand what happens, we'll now leave the car, use a helicopter or drone to see that the cost of that stop and go traffic is an on-ramp where cars are trying to get into the freeway that produces small disruptions, those little disruptions will be amplified and cause the stop and go waves in the same way as I have explained it before. However, now we can change the interactions between cars, assuming that they would have kind of a radar or laser scan system that measures the distances and relative velocities. And we could then have the cars accelerate and decelerate in a slightly different way that actually manages to dissolve the traffic jam, even though the same number of cars still tries to get into the freeway. So traffic conditions have been changed, but interactions between cars have been changed in such a way that the outcome of self organization would not anymore be stop and go traffic, but free traffic flow. So basically, we can succeed by using real-time measurements, data and feedback that would change the interaction slightly so that the system self organizes in a way that is favorable. And that does not only work in a <laughs> computer, by the way. Now, I think that is really changing perspectives on how to manage complex systems. And you know, the, the entire world is full of complex systems, right? I mean, that changes everything. Do you realize that? And then the question is really, how can we capitalize on this principle of self-organization to make systems better? And how much better would it be? Okay, so let's stay with traffic. But this time it's about which choice. And um, 
you've probably heard about the fact that if people selfishly choose their routes, I mean, everyone just optimizes, you know, takes the shortest route, you know, as we kind of expected to do. Um, this would not necessarily lead in the optimal systemic outcome, the optimal distribution of traffic. And as a result of that, there would be um, average delay, additional travel times on average, as compared to the optimal distribution of traffic. And the difference or the quotient actually of that is called the price of anarchy. And there are interesting kind of paradoxes in connection with those kind of systems. So assume we just have a system of those four routes over here, of uh, roads over here. And then we add one more road, which we would seem should improve traffic flow, but in fact, <laughs> the opposite is the case. And that's why it's called a paradox, right? So removing that street or closing it down would actually improve the traffic situation. This is the kind of paradoxical situations I've been talking about before, all right? So the problem to be solved is the price of anarchy, as it's being called. So basically it's claimed that you're the problem because you're selfish and that produces a suboptimal outcome for the system. And that problem needs to be fixed. And many people have suggested that we need to have a centralized system that knows everything about everyone in order to coordinate everyone's action, to optimize the outcome. Is that really needed? And is it actually even the best way of addressing those challenges such as the price of our key? Now uh, here's uh, one person in the room who knows a lot about this, uh, Cesare. Um, he's been working on this and he actually figured out that kind of changing the rules of decision making from selfish to, or fully rational as we tend to call it, to less selfish would actually improve the situation. In fact, adding noise even, you know, which you would expect would just create chaos, and make everything worse, turns out to be a solution to this kind of problem. Here, it improves the outcome. Okay, so some irrationality may actually be good for our society. Uh, a fact that's rarely discussed actually. So deviations from perfect selfishness do have potentially favorable outcomes. Okay, let's stay with the traffic flows in networks. And of course, we'd like to have fluid flow, but what often happens is actually this, right? A gridlock, terrible. <laughs> And this has now been designed, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> this, this happens in many cities every day, basically, you know, but it doesn't have to be this way. A couple of years back, I took a video recording in Egypt and I was totally amazed. And this is the video. Now, what you can see is there are no traffic lights. There are no police men or police women. Um, it's highly diverse traffic. You know, there's cars, buses, there are horses, even camel, camels, um, people walking. But it seems to work more or less perfectly. People are not being stopped for a long time. There are no queues. And why is this happening? Well, obviously, self-organization works over here. And why does it work? Because we do have a particular design with a unidirectional flow in the front, the opposite unidirectional flow in the back. And in between, there is a small buffer, which is really important because it allows everyone to adjust the speed in such a way that you would be able to take a gap 
which is somewhere in the traffic flow without having to stop anybody else to do that. And so this is how complex dynamical systems should work. We, they should be built for self-organization, right? And that has basically inspired us to come up with an entirely new traffic light control. You know, as institutions like ETH, we're not being asked to be modest, but to be ambitious. And so basically, at some point in time, actually, I started back in Dresden, um, we said, perhaps we could do traffic light control in a completely different way. Let's do tabula rasa, just forget about everything, how things were done in the past, and reinvent traffic light control. And in many cases, of course, that is a nice idea, but in the end, it doesn't work well. I mean, it may work, but not good enough, you know. So how well would it work and how would it work, you know? These are the kinds of questions. And as I indicated before, that was inspired by pedestrian flows and bottlenecks. Because in a sense, intersections and traffic flows are bottlenecks as well, just for more flow directions. And so the idea was, could we generalize the pressure principle that creates those self-organized oscillations to produce self-organized oscillations at intersections and then define traffic lights by this? That means the traffic lights would control, uh, the traffic flows would control the traffic lights rather than the other way around. Kind of turning things around from bottom-up control towards, from top-down control towards bottom-up control. All right, and here's two papers that you may want to look at. And the question is really, how well would that work? As we know, many revolutions fail. And uh, we need to compare the classical approach, which is based on a control center, central control in a sense. The control center is trying to collect as much data as possible about the traffic situation throughout the city and then tries to come up with an optimal plan for traffic light control and then imposes that on the city like a benevolent dictator, you know. Even though we claim we're living in a democracy, you know, when it comes to traffic, there's dictatorship. Um, does it have to be this way? Now, here in the middle, we visualize another approach. And uh, basically, every intersection tries to minimize travel time strictly based on the inflows of cars at the neighboring intersections, but ignoring all the other intersections. Just like Homo economicus, every intersection is treated like Homo economicus. Every intersection is trying to do strict the best, not caring about any other intersection. We would seen, well, should not work so well because of lack of coordination. And then there is a third approach, which basically does the same, but when there's a long queue, we would first clear the queue before we go back to double time minimization. So we make compromises um, in favor of the other intersection. So we're other regarding, and it's, uh, we would say that should actually also reduce the performance. So that, that should be the best today's system, that should be the second best and that should be the worst, according to traditional expectations. And let's see what happens. So if we do top down regulation through a traffic control center at an intersection, that as capacity utilization goes up, I mean, basically traffic flow increases. The queue lengths of cars behind red lights will increase kind of linearly, kind of what we would expect, all right? That looks plausible. 
And now the question is how, how well would homo economicus do? And turns out over here, much better. Why is that? Because traffic light would just respond to approaching vehicles when there's little traffic every vehicle will just get the green light as it approaches without even having to stop. There's a short-term forecast just to, considering the inflow into that road section. While the centralized traffic light control basically has a circular service pattern and you know you would have to wait somehow. However, it turns out that when the capacity utilization reaches a certain value, then suddenly the queue length explodes. So we can say that over here, Adam Smith's invisible hand works, self organization produces very good outcomes, but over there, Adam Smith's invisible hand fails. There is not enough coordination going on, somehow as expected. This is um, the, the percentage of how much traffic um, can be handled. And now there is the third approach, right? The other regarding approach, and turns out to be better all the way. Of course, it makes compromises that allow for coordination with the neighboring intersections. It creates a coordination just with the neighbors, but that coordination spreads throughout the city, and that is why this approach actually is doing so well. So we can make the invisible hand work by a combination of two principles that each of them don't work. which is uh, local travel time minimization and the clearing of the longest queue. We had a similar thing with the migratory games. You remember that we had two rules that each of them didn't work, but the combination worked wonderfully. Same thing here. Wouldn't expect that in the first place. But why do centralized control approaches not outperform everything else? And here is a point that um, people often don't tell you. Many complex dynamical systems, if you want to optimize them, are NP hard to optimize. I mean, the computational power explodes with the complexity of the system here, the number of traffic lights. And even for a city like Zurich, which is not the biggest city of the world, according to what I was told, Basically, with a reasonably expensive um, computer center, you cannot strictly optimize in real time, even with a supercomputer. That doesn't work because there is kind of trillions of possible parameter combinations, and you cannot check them all in real time. So you need to make simplifications. You would basically try to come up with a cyclical service. You would try to synchronize the cycles, you would then try to make it adapted by extending or shortening green times, but you don't reinvent the entire traffic control every single second. The decentralized approach is not based on a repetitive pattern. It just responds to the pressure. It responds flexibly to the local needs and opportunities, to the gaps that happen to be in the traffic flow. It uses those opportunities, those gaps. And this is how it can outperform. So kind of planning and control, as you can see over here, doesn't seem to be the best thing, but rather flexibly adapting to local conditions can outperform centralized optimization control. Kind of mind-blowing, of course, we didn't expect that, but unfortunately that also applies to many other systems. We'll have to come back to that. 
Now that was all simulation for simple systems. And then the question is how well does it work in reality, right? And that is often where things crash. And so at that time we were talking to the traffic control authority in Western and said, you know, could we collaborate and basically implement this principle? And they said, hmm, you know, basically we have, we're happy. We just bought a state-of-the-art traffic control system and that responds to traffic measurement and produces green waves. So we're happy, but for one thing, we'd like to prioritize public transportation, but if we do that, it destroys our green waves. And if green waves are destroyed, we'll have traffic jams and it will grow quickly to form a monster congestion throughout the entire center of the city. And that's why we cannot prioritize public transportation. Because in fact, not only is the street network highly non-quadratic, entirely irregular and complex, but also we have disruptions by those public transportation lines, various trams and buses. You know, each of them takes a different class and comes at a different time. And so it's just something that is mess up your entire system. And that's what it did, basically. So they public transportation was kind of squeezed in between the green waves. And I said, okay, if you think you're smart, you know, take it and see what you can do. And then um, Stefan Lemmer, who was a PhD student of my team at this time, was actually facing that challenge. And so he took the same input data. He produced um, the self-controlled traffic light control patterns and compare them with the state of the art control. So here you can clearly see those imposed green waves that are being produced by the state of the art control. The flexible self control that responds to local conditions is a lot more irregular because there are variations in traffic flow, right? But still you can see traces of green waves. So green waves are happening by self-organization, just it's not a periodic pattern. So which one is better? Well, basically I told you already, um, but here's the surprise. It's not only allowing for a prioritization of public transport, which benefits a lot as they hoped, but it's not at the cost of motorized individual, individual traffic flow. They don't have to pay the price for it. They also benefit actually from that increased flexibility and also the pedestrian cyclists and altogether you have less congestion, which means it's also better for the environment. Because we turned everything around. We went from top down planning and control to bottom up self organization flexibly responding to local actual needs at that point in time. Of course, since those times when we worked on this, a few years have passed. And now in the meantime, we have machine learning and AI. And the question is, wouldn't that do everything much better? And this is what people do expect. And uh, we have a PhD student in our team. Marcin is his name. He's been working on it. He's a machine learning specialist, so it's study that, and he wanted to do a traffic light control based on machine learning. And then came the pandemic and he got a bit bored and he started implementing uh, the self-control approach, which is called here analytic plus because it's based on analytic mathematical formulas. And it turns out in disrupted systems in particular, you know, when there's accidents sometimes, there are building sites, the building size could be here, this today, and tomorrow it would be over there. So real conditions of disrupted systems, in those systems, the self-control approach 
is outperforming all the other approaches. So machine learning just takes too much time to learn change situations. So perhaps machine learning would come up with the best solution ever, but by the time it's learned it, the world has changed. So if you have the best solution for a situation that never happens, you don't have the best solution. Sorry to say that. Nothing against machine learning, you know, we can combine the two approaches and so on, and that often gives benefits. So, you know, don't get me wrong, but AI is not the solution for everything, not the best solution for everything. And that's an important point because in what world do you want to live in? Some world or the best of all worlds, be honest, right? The best of all worlds. So why should we do something worse than that? All right, so basically the conclusion is we cannot control everything top down. Some kind of chaotic approach to Jeffy like control, the self control can actually outperform things. And then, actually, Stefan and his collaboration partners are now working on new projects for some time in various cities. And one of them was Lucerne in Switzerland. And so um, they've come up with the self control approach for a couple of traffic lights. Um, and the CERN was checking it out. So they were making measurements before with their state-of-the-art control. And they were measurement, uh, doing measurements afterwards. And there were stunning improvements. I mean, 50 to 33%, you know, that's quite something. Kind of unexpected. And that was evaluated independently by a professorship at ETH, I did not even know about it, so that kind of happened almost secretly, I would say. And you saw um, that they came to the conclusion that actually it was beneficial to all modes of transport, so more green for everyone. Something that sounds impossible, but that impossibility was actually accomplished by avoiding wasting green tiles, okay? I have a question about this. Because in principle, when you have like one member of traffic that only one stair, would it be possible that you never get two EV cars? How much the first and the other to get three of those very simple things? It could happen if there wasn't a parameter in the system that takes care of exactly this, that there would be a maximum reg time. So, that thing should never happen. But it's a good point you're making. And then so it was evaluated and um, this uh, turned out to be a super traffic light as it was actually called by them, not by us. And so they were pretty happy. And this is now also finding interest in other countries. And with those insights, I'd like to get back to sustainability. Because this is an example where really we need to create the best of all worlds. If we don't do that, it's going to be bad for, for everyone, perhaps even. We know we're in big trouble, okay? But how to solve that problem? The United Nations came up with uh, 17 goals, actually more than 170 targets. And then the question, how do you reach all those goals? By 2030, you know, preferably like, not much time left, actually. And uh, people came up uh, with a proposal, oh, okay, let's use AI. And there is probably not just one paper, but in, there is in particular this paper, over here, which basically looks into the benefits of using AI for those different UN goals. I see for some goals, the benefits are expected to be bigger, for some smaller, and then there are also some adverse effects. 
and that was nothing measured because you know, how do you know what the benefits in future will be? So it's based on expert opinions. And that, those could also change over time. You know, if you now read the news about AI could be a threat to humanity altogether, you know, <laughs> not my words right now. I mean, I was also born a couple of years back, but now it's really the, the big shots in AI, Google, Open AI, Elon Musk, you know, uh, they're warning. So most likely the green part has shrinked and the yellow part has become bigger. But anyway, so the question is, even if we could use AI for everything, should we do that? Would that give us the best solution? And somehow the yeah. idea was around that we could basically optimize the world with a war room approach, right? So it's like the traffic control center, basically. You have a data center that collects as much data as possible, and then you try to optimize, and then you try to impose that optimal, supposedly optimal solution on the world, no matter what. And I guess by now you're a bit suspicious that this is going to produce really the best version of our future and of the world. In fact, I do think it's not going to deliver the best solutions, perhaps not even good enough. And it also has to do with those curves over here, right? So we're coming from a time where we did not have enough data to take good decisions. And now we're in a time where we can do evidence-based decision-making using big data, okay? You know, data can be good for better decision-making, no question at all, right? Data isn't bad, AI isn't bad, it really depends on what we're doing with it. How we're using it, right? And there, as it turns out, limitations. Now, interestingly enough, uh, processing power is claimed to increase exponentially according to Moore's law. It doubles about every 18 months. Data volume, however, grows faster. At the time when I produced that figure, it doubled every 12 months which means that in just one year, you produce as much data as in all previous years of human history, which is already mind blowing. In the future, it will be every 12 hours, which is just unbelievable. But anyway, this curve grows faster than the processing power, which means that we cannot process all the data we produce. And that basically creates dark data. They're data, we don't know what is in them. And it creates a problem that we need to decide what part of the data to process and in what way. You need science, you cannot automate that. There is no algorithm that will always pick the right data and the right algorithm to come up with the best outcome. There are a lot of good solutions, probably better solutions in this dark area over here. That's the number one problem, okay? But that's not the only problem because also we're continuing networking the world and there are combinatorial possibilities to create new links and combinatorial curves grow even quicker than exponential curves. That means systemic complexity grows faster than even the data volume. And that creates a paradoxical situation that even though we have more data than ever and the best technology of all times, we are losing control of that network world as we're trying to control it in a top-down way. We need a new control approach. And in fact, there is one, fortunately, you've just learned about it. It's kind of the bottom-up self-organization that can do the job for us. We just need to learn how to make things happen, right? So there is a solution. 
there is a better future. But we need to take into account the importance of complexity and the current approach often doesn't do that. We now are living in a time where companies are trying to produce digital twins of everything. Yes? Yes? This, this curve is um, basically arguing the number of possibilities to network in a system among so and so many nodes grows factorial with the number of nodes. That doesn't mean that all possibilities are being realized, but most likely it's a certain percentage of possibilities that will take place. And that would still be more or less factorial. It, well, there are a thousand different networks. There's an electrical grid, there are street networks, there are friendship networks, there are trading bonds, there are the, uh, you, you have the transactions in the financial market, all of that creates network links, you know? So there are a hell of a lot of network links and that creates a, a hell of a lot of complexity. So complexity science needs to be taken into account. I think that is what you have understood by now. And importantly, there's not just a price of anarchy, but there's also a price of optimization and control, which has not been talked about a lot perhaps the first people to learn about <laughs> kind of explicitly. So it's a new slide. And in fact, uh, the prize of optimization is that all goals but the ones optimized for are ignored, right? I mean, if you start optimizing, you get better in performance typically in those dimensions that are your goals, but at the cost of everything else potentially. Right? The price of control is, well, the loss of freedom and uh, in many cases, diversity, creativity, and innovation. And that should concern us. So could we come up with a way of managing complex systems that don't have those issues? And in fact, my team is working on this and um, I'm very positive that this is possible and that will really change things to the positive. Let's come back to food, right? Food is about production, logistics, and supply chains. Now, I showed you that slide already. About a third of the world's food is wasted. So people claim the world is overpopulated. Perhaps that's not right. Perhaps we just don't have good enough logistics to make everyone reasonably happy. And things are actually particularly bad for food. And why is that? Because it's a perishable good typically, right? So that means the amount of food you can eat today is more than the amount of that food that you can eat tomorrow and so on, because there is some time where food turns bad and you cannot eat it anymore. So it's very important that you get it quickly into the place where people need that food. There's not a lack of food in the world, it's just we don't have the logistics at the moment to get the food to all the places where that food is needed. Does it have to be this way? I don't think so. There are quite some analogies between traffic and production. So those systems are similar, mathematically speaking. Some of the learnings from traffic flow and control can be transferred to production logistics systems, as you can read in several papers that I've written about this, so it's not just a claim. And then coming back to this example I 
mentioned at the beginning, chip production, right? Yeah. I'm a fan of digital technology, right? You can see that, uh, just how to do it right. And so um, this was also in Dresden, Athenian Technologies was um, producing wafers. Yeah. Those are the silicon plates with the structures that which uh, turn, be turned into chips. And in order to do that, those vapors have to go through various chemical treatments to etch out structures. And in between, you need to wash away the chemicals in water basses, okay? And there is a so-called handler that moves around the silicon vapors, and that has to take care of several sets of silicon vapors, and so it may be busy. And being busy means um, you cannot always respond to requests immediately. There will be delays. And delays could mean that the chips will not be good enough quality anymore. You can throw them away. That means you lose throughput that you can sell. And they had difficulties really getting up the throughput to the levels that they expected from the machines that they had bought for expensive money. And they had, of course, engineers, and I guess some of them had PhDs and all of this, but they were going about this problem in the conventional ways. And so they were desperate and said, oh, can you have a look at this with fresh eyes, basically? You know, they had read about the pedestrian stuff and said, perhaps you have an idea. So we went there, it was very interesting to see the production. You need to wear special suits because a single grain uh, of whatever, you know, could destroy the equipment um, or the silicon vapor. So kind of the clean room atmosphere, we were in there and I had to look at this and I told them, I think the problem may be that you're trying to rush the production to have as much throughput as possible, but that creates coordination problems for the handler. So that's increased treatment times and that slower is faster effect occurred make the production 30% more efficient. So it's more than 30% more efficient. They were pretty happy. All right, this is just one example, right? So 30% is possible. Yes? Here? Yeah. I had many years back. I, I can't really uh, tell you what happened every year, but perhaps there's also some maintenance that needs to happen in between. I would have to make something up. So it is not always on that level, as you can see, that's also not what I claim, but on average, it's performing much better. All right, so now with that complexity thinking, how could we basically approach the sustainability issues? And we've been thinking about it, and that's our proposal. So we currently have wasteful supply chains in many cases, right? So fresh resources are being used to produce products in large numbers to make them cheap. Then they're pushed on you with advertisements and you buy stuff that perhaps you don't even need. After some time, you throw it away. So it's a very wasteful system. And I think everyone agrees that if we had a circular economy where we reuse the resources, recycle, and so on, that would solve our problems to a large extent. But how to get there? Why don't we have that kind of system at the moment? Regulation didn't do the job so far. But here's a new technology, it's called the Internet of Things. So basically, now you can build cheap sensors for almost everything. So measuring data is becoming cheap, but the question is now how to do that. Do you have to collect all this data in one place centrally and keep it forever? My answer is no. We just need to have the real-time feedback and then you can throw away the data. It's the feedback that allows 
the real-time feedback that allows the coordination to happen, okay? So, however, with those sensors that are connected to the internet, that's why it's called Internet of Things, I can measure noise, CO2, all sorts of emissions, poisons, but also good things. And then what you want to do is basically increase positive externalities, reduce negative ones, and ensure a fair compensation. And of course, you're talking about carbon tax and all of this, but is that good enough? And we say no, because for a complex system, you need not just one feedback loop, but many typically. And so our proposal is to have a multi-dimensional money system where money is basically defined by uh, a measurement procedure. And as you can have different measurement procedures, you can have different kinds of money that can be used uh, to create incentives, but multiple different incentives for noise, for CO2, for water, for you know, whatever matters to you, culture, social, it's, so you can have many different um, incentives. And this would introduce new forces into our economy in such a way that you would not optimize the system in one big action, but everyone would try to improve little by little over the situation that they find. And the co-evolutionary process would come into play where everyone responds to the situation around them, which is improving and everyone is improving. So altogether that system co-evolves towards a more circular and sharing economy. That's the vision. Why are we saying really that would make a big difference? Because a multi-dimensional approach is a paradigm change. Now we have a utilitarian approach. If you optimize, you basically have a one-dimensional goal function because that's what's needed to compare two numbers and say, this number is bigger than that one, which allows you to decide this solution is better than the other one. It's one dimensionality. A one-dimensional goal function, of course, oversimplifies many complex systems. So there's the issue. You think you have an optimal solution, but in fact, you have an optimal solution for an oversimplified problem. You don't really have an optimal solution for the real system. And so what you really want to have is a system that can improve on many different goals and dimensions. And optimization is most likely, according to our analysis, not the way of achieving that. So we are developing new ways, but just to give you a perspective of what difference it makes. This is a typical supply network of today, okay? Basically it's hierarchical. There is a certain flow direction. There are no cycles in there. It's not circular. And there's a reason for it. You know, if you want to control you want to, the system to be controllable and cycles kind of reduce your control, controllability because if you control this and that controls this, who then controls the process, right? So cycles are typically considered to be bad for control. A military, for example, would not introduce cyclical decision-making tasks or so. It's all hierarchical for control. And that's, if you take a top-down optimization and control approach, I think we'll never really have a circular result. And that's why we don't have a circular economy. It's as easy as that, you know. On the other hand, there is a solution. We know that. And it's called nature. Nature is a circular system. All the resources are being reused and recycled. So we know there's a solution. That solution has resulted over millions of years, but not by optimization by a centralized computer or brain that collects um, data from all over the world 
and comes up with a solution, imposes it. Now there is not such a computer, there's no centralized data collection or an optimization in the strict sense. Instead, there is co-evolution. And that has sorted it out. We just need to learn from nature. And this is how it looks like, you know, it's a typical metabolic network. Uh, so basically, uh, supply chain as we have it in our bodies. Now, every animal, every human being, every, every tree has some kind of such a supply chain. It's not a chain anymore. You see all those circles in there, right? It's a lot more circular because it's not hierarchical. So we need to have a new approach that's really built on self-organization and co-evolution. And I'd like to remind you that the world is not a zero-sum game, which we also easily forget in this world of money, which often looks like a zero-sum game. Of course, it's also not. Um, but in network systems, you can create symbiosis where everyone benefits if things go well. Now, back to game theory and to the homo economicus. Right? So I've been raised with this picture that people are selfish. And it couldn't be different. That was kind of the, the paradigm. The idea basically was, if we were not selfish, we were giving away resources to other people. You know, they could raise more children. I could raise less children. They would spread the selfish people, the, uh, the people who do share their uh, resources, would spread less. And, and so basically the selfish people will be left over after many generations. And so that's why we would all have to be selfish. That was somehow the concept and the idea behind the homo economicus. And then after decades of theorizing, economists did um, experiments, for example, about the dictator game and ultimatum game and so on, they were shocked that people behaved differently from what they always thought they behaved. Can we understand that? People are more social, less selfish. And in fact, uh, we've uh, introduced this word of homo socialis for that. And here's the paper. And in this paper, basically, we have implemented economic and biological thinking. And there are four rules, basically, in a two-dimensional interaction grid between the agents of that simulated world. There's an artificial society, in a sense. And here, agents are assumed to decide according to a best response rule that strictly maximizes their utility function given the behaviors of their interaction partners and neighbors. And that's what is familiar to economists, you know, they would probably agree that's not a bad idea to assume that. And then, like in economics, um, we have a utility function that's been um, maximized according to that uh, best response rule, and that utility function does not only consider the own payoff, that's an assumption, but gives potentially a certain way to the payoff of the interaction partners. And that way is called the friendliness, and however, it's set to zero for everyone at the beginning of the simulation. That means we start off with homo economicus. Everyone is selfish, nobody is friendly. That is how we start. But there are two more rules. And one is uh, friendliness is a trait that is inherited, either genetically or by education through offspring. The likelihood to have an offspring increases exclusively with the own payoff, not the utility function, because you have to pay in the end the bill, right? Uh, so the payoff is assumed to be zero when a friendly agent is exploited by all neighbors, I mean, if all of them defect and uh, that one agent is cooperative. So kind of, if there was a Jesus, you know, uh, basically 
would be a very painful experience. There would not be uh, any offspring. And so that kind of behavior would not spread. But also there is mutation. So inherited friendliness values tend to be those of the parent, but there's a mutation rate which however is implemented in such a way that, that it does not just promote friendliness to high values. That would be a bad trick. So basically the implementation would lead to an expectation of eventually a friendliness value of 0.2 due to that mutation. In fact, it turns out to become much higher than that. And now the question is, are economists right or have they been right? And the question, uh, uh, the, the answer is yes, sort of in a large part of that parameter space, homo economicus actually results. But there is a little corner down there where homo socialis results. And this happens basically when offspring are born and raised in the neighborhood and not in a random place. Random place would be over here, neighborhood would be over here. But that is what people do, right? People raise their children with them. Actually, for a surprisingly long time, say 18 years or so, you know, it's just a as compared to other species, it's amazing. And that is the explanation why we actually, we are more social than expected. Of course, I need to say, you know, there are a lot of economists that uh, do similar work now, but um, I, I think overall the perspective on people in economics has changed dramatically. And uh, I would say to, to the better. So there's a hope for a better future. So evolution makes many of us other regarding and we can see it over here. Actually, it takes a bit of time, quite a few generations. But then eventually the average friendliness goes up and, and also the share of cooperation. So in the beginning, we are living in a world where most people are selfish, there's little friendliness, and those people who do cooperate are exploited. That means they have a lower payoff as compared to those who are defecting based on their selfishness. But then after many generations, more than 50 actually, suddenly this is changing. And then cooperators tend to be surrounded by other cooperators, which makes cooperation profitable. And that's when cooperation can thrive and actually the factors are not making as much money or not having so much success. So this is how it looks in the course of time. This is in the course of time over generations. We start with zero friendliness. I mean, everyone is unfriendly in the beginning, right? But over generations, the proportion of people who are unfriendly is going down, as you can see, kind of explanation perhaps. And eventually we have a distribution of friendliness that looks like this, kind of around 0.4, say. And In fact, experiments support that. So it's a colleague and his team, uh, Ryan Morphy, who's done that experiment and shows that, yes, there are some selfish people called individualistic over here, but most people are pro-social to some degree, to some extent, some more, some less, but yes, it's something very common. But that has really important implications for the way we should organize our economy, right? If kind of the economic thinking has led to recommendations regarding the institutions we should build based on selfishness, and in fact, people are not that selfish, perhaps there would be other institutions 
better suited to support homosocialism in their other regarded behaviors, right? And uh, just to give a positive perspective, that basically what this model says, also if we have two different populations, you know, so we can see different colors, everyone detecting the beginning, because everyone is unfriendly, but then there's uh, births and deaths, and there's um, inheritance of friendliness values and so mutation. Eventually, first of all, populations are mixing, but also cooperative classes are forming first among people of the same population, but eventually also mixing between populations. So I'll end up with a friendly world where most people cooperate with all sorts of people. So, you know, waiting for world peace to happen, basically. Um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And just to make it clear, homosocialism is not just a little inaccuracy of the concept of homo economicus, it's really something different, quite different. And you don't have um, independent uh, decision, selfish decisions that can be um, often described by standard econometric methods, but you have interdependent decisions of homo socialis because of the friendliness and that interdependent decision making creates complex dynamics and unexpected outcomes in this case is favorable with a lot of cooperation, a lot of friendliness um, and basically it comes with network thinking that is evolving over time, all right? So I do think that we'll see a transformation of our economy towards a new kind of economy, perhaps even a more or less sudden transformation to a self-regulating participatory market society. We are not yet fully there, but what makes me so optimistic that this would happen, that it would work, among others, that there was Eleanor Ostrom who got the Nobel Prize for her work. Some of that work was carried out here in Switzerland where she actually showed that self-organization, self-governance, as she calls it, works in society given proper design principles. So she came up with eight principles, um, the Ostrom principles. And uh, just want to reiterate that Coordination and cooperation don't require a centralized control approach. There are many decentralized mechanisms that would support coordination and cooperation. This includes reputation systems. So ratings could uh, be helpful in certain circumstances. Also, there's really some very nice work of Heinrich sitting here in the room, who's shown that um, a merit-based matching mechanism and would lead to a situation where everyone could be better off. So if more cooperative people are matched with other more cooperative people, that creates a trend towards more cooperation altogether. So it will benefit society according to those concepts altogether. We've also looked um, together with Michael Mays, who's now at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, into competition between different kinds of cooperation mechanisms. And the question was, what works best? And you know how expensive would it be? Because some of those mechanisms are costly, you know, costly punishment. Perhaps you've heard about that, um, yeah. or cost, costly signaling and so on. So there are costs involved. Um, and considering this, um, we have been looking at a variety of different mechanisms like peer punishment, altruistic signaling, free signaling, costly signaling, uh, and so on. 
And uh, according to what I recall, altruistic signaling uh, is actually performing best. So it's not punishment that we need to make cooperation happen. So we, no, we don't need punishment and we don't need centralization. Actually, centralization may not actually be at all the best way of reaching coordination and cooperation. Rather, we'd like to have a decentralized approach and that could be based on digital assistance. So we would have devices that uh, provide us with good information about the situation around us and uh, how we can take better decisions. And if everyone improves a bit and keeps improving in response to an improving system, then obviously, you know, it will lift us all up to a better world. And real-time feedback is one of the key success principles in this. Now, also this can be used to upgrade democracy. And in the inspiring example is actually swarm intelligence. That thing would be done by planes at the airport. I think we would not feel very comfortable using a plane, but birds are doing a very good job coordinating. And they don't optimize, of course, their behavior. They respond just to their neighbors. That's how they do it. And that's, that's the trick. Now, the idea of self organization is actually not new. There's also a very exciting example, beehives. Those are, bees are social beings. Um, they have run something that you could call a society, of course, much simpler than our society. But anyway, we could certainly be inspired by beehives. And there is a table of the bees, a book, from 1714, where the vision was rolled out basically. And now the question is, couldn't we do that 300 years later using new technology? Of course, considering that people are a lot smarter, a lot more complex, a lot more diverse. And in fact, that is the goal of building digital democracy. So the idea is would to go away from top-down decision maker by one person who may consider himself or herself a benevolent dictator or a supercomputer center trying to do a similar thing. But instead to collect the best ideas of many people and put them together in ways that benefit as many people as possible. And this is what the concept of collective intelligence is about. Of course, the question is, does it work? And how would it work? And the answer is yes, it does work under certain circumstances. We all know there are also madness of crowd phenomena, so it doesn't always work. Um, but there are really hundreds of examples of collective intelligence. Uh, wisdom of crowds is also another term often used. Uh, in particular, it was the Netflix price. And basically, Netflix set an algorithm to make recommendations to their customers. And they wanted to come up with better recommendations because that would keep people online for a longer time. It basically, would uh, keep them with their services as compared to competitors, okay? So a good recommendation is important. They realized that they already had big data algorithms, but they wanted to have a better one and they wanted uh, it to be, uh, I don't recall exactly, but let's say 10% better than what they had to get the million that they offered in exchange, you know? Sounds like an easy way of making a million, but it turns out that actually it took a long time for people to come up with better solutions. And 
for I think for more than a year, they did not actually uh, jump over the 10% line. And then eventually, that's well, somehow the story I have in mind, the boss of one of the teams basically came in and said, yeah, don't you want to do something else eventually, you know? So um, basically lost patience. And so a new approach was needed. And then they said, okay, let's combine, let's try, uh, let's combine our solution with another solution, say the second best or third best. And what would you expect? That this should reduce the performance of the best solution. Surprisingly, that was not the case. Instead, the combined solution, where you combine the best with an inferior solution, improved the overall solution and it jumped over the percent line right away. Then other teams tried to do the same thing. They also jumped over the 10% line. So, you know, that was the trick to combine different supposedly best individual solutions to create new integrated solutions that work even better. So diversity is key for success and not the individual best. And this can also be supported by special incentive systems as this DNS paper over here suggests. And altogether, I'd like to say network effects make all the differences. They create potentially a lot of trouble, but if you understand how they work, you can use them for good. You can use them to allow wonderful things to happen, even by self organization that the system would do what you want it to do by itself. Just the right kind of interactions need to be in place. And just to have two examples, Collective intelligence could be one of the outcome and obviously our society would benefit a lot from that. And a more sustainable system could be another outcome. And if you thought that was interesting, perhaps you'd like to read a bit more. And there's actually a book and this book over here looks at two kinds of digital societies or worlds. In the first chapter, it looks at top-down controlled approaches. In the second part, it looks at the bottom-up self-organization approaches and explains that a bit in more detail than I could do it over here. With this, I'm finishing with a simulation of that world peace scenario. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> And of course, you can ask questions or make comments. Um, still a few minutes to go, if you like. Yes? Thank you very much. Couldn't the center of the just emulate the bottom-up approach, and then when you have additional information and maybe better, it's only because of communication? This is a very good question, I would say. And I've heard it several times, also in different contexts, because that's what say the military would say, you know, let's build that system that knows everything and collects all the data and then we decide how to use it and basically couldn't we use it in any possible way and even in a decentralized way. In principle, you can do that. But the issue is there are kind of thousands, millions, trillions of decentralized uh, ways of doing things. And you need to pick the, the right ones. And that, that is kind of the challenge, right? So there, there's a big chance that among those millions and trillions of possibilities to come up with decentralized approaches, you would pick an um, inferior solution. Not the best for sure. And why is that? It's exactly for the dark data kind of problem. You just cannot go through all possibilities, not even the most powerful quantum computer app. Just optimize the soft phase of the entire, the third phase of the computer. Like, I mean, the same one, 
Right, and chances are that you uh, happen to choose a solution that's not going to be the best. And that's why we need many eyes, you know, to identify not just one possible solution, but many possible, try them out. And then that's what the evolution is about. We throw away the not so good solutions. We spread the better solutions. We keep improving those. But it needs many people to identify which solutions work well. And so that's why you cannot centralize. And that's good news, actually, for us. So we still have a purpose, even in times of chat GPT. 